Hello, Probers. Howdy, howdy. Welcome to But It Was Alien. <laughs> the best damn extraterrestrial comedy podcast hosted by two former MIBs in the universe. Now, nah, scrap that, son, in the multiverse. I am your host this week, Moonwalker, and opposite me, as always, is the bearded one, Kevin the Grey. Beard. And yes, I can moonwalk. And I can grow a beard. Each week, we take it in turns to bring a case to the table, dissect it, and decide whether or not we believe it is truly extraterrestrial or not. That we do. And I agree, I concur... We are the best damn extraterrestrial comedy podcast hosted by two former MIBs for Can You Show Me? Two other people who admit to being MIBs. (laughs) Former. Allegedly. Truthfully. Truthfully. This week, we are investigating the claims of one Brian Scott. He has two first names. A first name for a surname. Like someone else we know. Brian was born October 12th, 1943. If if you took that one out, because one is quite a weak number, it's the smallest number. Zero doesn't count. It's not a number. It's a concept. Get your mind around that, Biarch. If you took that one out, that would be a really powerful day to be born on. I feel it. In your bones? That two in the 12 is a huge number. Real big, strong number. Well, Brian was celebrating his 16th birthday in 1959. I can confirm that that math adds up. Sweet 16, baby! What's he getting for his birthday? Do you know? We're about to find out. Really? So that evening, after celebrating his birthday, he was out walking the dog. He got a dog for birthday? It wasn't long before Brian... a dog for my birthday? It wasn't long before Brian noticed that a strange orange ball of light was hovering over the top of his dog. I want a dog, mother trucker. Taken aback, he stood and stared at it. The longer he looked, the more it seemed that it was semi-solid, especially so at the core. Hmm. Brian continued to watch the strange ball of light. The light. The light made its way over to him from the dog. It settled right in front of his face and just hovered there. Then, as if in the blink of an eye, it vanished up into the air. Perplexed, Brian's brain tried to make sense of the situation. I just had a little moment over here. <laughs> so your brain trying to make what... sense of the situation. <laughs> yeah, I've just cross-wired my mind. <laughs> Reboot. He believes that in that moment, before the ball of light vanished, some sort of communication had taken place. Uh-huh. As strange thoughts and pictures began to enter his mind. Oh. These thoughts were not his own. But Bri- they were. Brian believes the orange ball is responsible for this communication. And this is all we have. So to summarise, we have the story of Brian Scott up to this point. Because 12 years later, in 1971, something otherworldly was about to happen to Brian. Something otherworldly? So this wasn't otherworldly? Not compared to what is coming up. Now, how do we know that these thoughts weren't Brian's own? Because they were in his head. I put it to you, Mr. Moonwalker. (laughs) I put it to you! These were indeed Brian's thoughts. He just didn't want to take ownership of them. Do we know anything about these thoughts and pictures that entered his mind? We don't. I reckon it was real dark shit and Brian didn't want to admit it. Like, he was walking the dog. (laughs) (laughs) Just for a split second. And he didn't mean anything by it. But for a split second, the thought popped into his head. What if? And that was enough. Before we continue, can you remember your 16th birthday? No. Can you remember my 16th birthday? No. I remember mine. Had a house party. And uh, a certain person who now lives in South Korea um, was rolling around on the floor outside complaining of stomach cramps. He really (laughs) wanted an Oxo Cube. (laughs) Why an Oxo Cube? I have no idea. He wanted to make some gravy. (laughs) 
Yeah, I can um, remember that now that you say that. You used to have a fair few house, house parties. They were pretty decent. Indeed. And uh, someone else got caught upstairs cheating on their significant other at the time. Yeah. Parties were pretty sick. They They were indeed. I can't really remember many of my birthdays, if any. I can remember my 21st, I think. You weren't there because I was living in Norwich at that point. And I'd got really drunk on the night before my birthday. And my flatmates, all 12 of them, decided to throw me a party. And my head was banging. I'd drunk so much that my blood must have got so thin that I had a nosebleed. And it just wouldn't stop. Oh. And I kept on like shooting to my bedroom just to lay down. <laughs> yeah, this is a lovely party, guys. <laughs> I remember my 24th, England played, got drunk on some form of alcohol I don't normally drink Mm. and I turned violent and I'm not a violent (laughs) drunk and I decided I was just gonna walk home (laughs) yeah I can remember a few of I can't remember which one was which but I can remember a few of your birthdays I don't really remember mine other than that one because we normally end up far too wasted yeah bad habit but then saying that the one Christmas Eve I can remember is the one we were most wasted never again so from October 12th, 1959 to March 14th, 1971, if you double that 14 in March, you get a very, very shitty number. powerful number. <laughs> Brian was with his friend Corbin. Oh, God. <clears throat> no, it uh, looks like Happy Corbin. <laughs> but it wasn't Happy Corbin was... or King Corbin. It was Nick Corbin. Uh the superior model. They were driving to the open desert near the coincidentally named Superstition Mountains, just outside of Phoenix, Arizona. Why were they there? Brian has no idea. All he knows is that he felt it would be a great place for them to do some target shooting. He just had a feeling that he needed to be there. You've got a picture in the research notes. That does look pretty... Superstitious. That's not where I was going. I was going to say quite picturesque, but then I suddenly realised those cactuses are like what you get in a computer game in a secluded desert where there ain't shit around. (laughs) So if I was there, chances are I'm dying in the next 12 hours. And there ain't shit there. There ain't no coffee shops. Ain't ain't no coffee shops. Ain't no rum stands. Ain't nothing to keep me going. I mean, there's wild animals, but I'm no hunter. I'd just stroke them as I... (laughs) Laid starving. As they're eating you. (laughs) They're eating me. Yeah, there. Who's a good boy? They've started a fire. (laughs) I'm stroking it whilst I'm... They're hog-tying me. You good boy. You good girl. Oh, it's a good them. You good people. Goes to bite your big toe. Not that one. (laughs) And for the exact same reason, they pulled the vehicle over, not knowing exactly why, but just had a feeling. Both of them? Mm Mm-hmm. Both of them got out of the vehicle and scanned the area from where they stood. Brian looked up, and as he did, he saw a strange craft appear overhead into his scope of view. It suddenly started to head towards Brian. He wanted desperately to run, but before his body could respond to his brain, the strange craft was directly above him. Run, Brian! The craft was described as oval with a glow to it. A funny kind of glow. Orange glow? And once overhead, it was so big that it blocked out the sky. And again, before he could react to anything, he describes a pulsating feeling taking hold of him. A pulsating, pulling feeling. Hopefully not his butt. Whatever this feeling was, it was also physically moving him pulling him up from the ground within a beam of light. What he experienced next was like a sensory overload. The cold air which seemed to come from the craft above him, the warm Arizona air around him, and the view of the downtown Phoenix lights from above. Wait, Phoenix lights? They're in Phoenix, Arizona, not the Phoenix lights (laughs) UFO. (laughs) <laughs> but what if they were? It was on the same night. <laughs> so there's a pulsating feeling. Do you think that's what a tractor beam would feel like if you were within it? 
quite possibly. Yeah, it has like... a weird hum to it, doesn't it? Like a vibrating. Mm-hmm. Well, hum. last time I was in one, yeah. Did it suck you up? Sucked me up and off into the distance. Whee! <laughs> so Brian now found himself within this strange spaceship. As he gathered his wits and looked around, he was shocked to find that Nick was already there and seemed to be waiting for him. Don't trust Corbin. (laughs) Brian and Nick are then led to a small room. Big Nick. As they entered the room, they noticed that the room contained a mist of fog to it. A second door elsewhere in the room abruptly opened, and behind door number two was... Was... (laughs) <laughs> Mr. Moon Walker has put a picture in the research notes from was it Blind Date or yep. is that Strike It not Strike It Lucky sorry um, the other Cilla Black program it is Blind Date UK program in the 90s not sure if it was about earlier 80s to 2003 in, I think it how was. deeply have you probed Cilla Black who's no longer with us rest in peace the, I did actually look her up after doing <laughs> I can't remember the name of the other show, though, annoyingly. But, no. National Treasure, Cilla Black. Blind Date ran from 85 to 2001, and the other show from 87 to 2003. I can't remember for the life of me what that was called. I keep saying Strike It Lucky, but that was a Matthew no, Kelly show. That was. wasn't that. Oh, but it's going to bug me. Bug me. He's going to have to Google it. <laughs> it's cracking. But whilst he's Googling it, I'm going to let you know that this picture is Scylla Black laughing with a lady whilst a gentleman is wearing a pair of chaps with his butt cut out, turning around, looking over his shoulder at Scylla and the lady, smiling and laughing. So behind door number two. Surprise, surprise. Surprise, surprise. Ah, oh, it's close with the S. 84 to 2001, blind date 85, 2003. Supply, supplies. But no, it wasn't this gentleman that awaited them, but several beings described as having rhino or crocodile type skin and a Ooh. thick patch of hide over the front of their torso. Reptilians. They stood at about seven foot Wait, tall. Hide? Hairy reptilians? Oh, hi. Sorry. Hairy reptilians. I don't know that we've had this before. I thought we'd seen it all at this point. They've got rugs on their chests. Sex rugs. So, so the reptilian can lay down. Missionary, baby. <laughs> Whilst the other reptilian is sitting on top of them, stroking their rug. Beautiful. How pleasant. Sorry. They stood at about seven foot me. tall. And had three long claw-like fingers and a thumb. A poseable thumb. The beings stripped both Brian and Nick of their clothes. Oh, shit. And led them into two separate locations. Oh, shit. Brian believes that he was either floating or was being carried. Probably being carried then. (laughs) Yeah. He was then placed against a wall and restrained there by some kind of invisible force before being given a... Probe. Physical examination. That thumb's going to come in handy any second. (laughs) (laughs) Is that from, like, Spider-Man or something? Yeah, it's the rhino from the old school, like, 60s Spider-Man cartoon. Oh, no. (laughs) I can't even describe that. He's got a creepy-ass grin on him. Well played. Continue. Child. <laughs> well, the rhino doesn't have a rug. Where's the rug? You can see. I told you that's important to I me. Mean, I say that's if... important to me like I want my partner to have a rug on their <laughs> chest. <laughs> Massive furry rug so that I can bury my head in it and nuzzle. Ah. Oh, he's peeping through a window, it would seem, at the moment. <laughs> so... look, yeah, he looks a bit pervy, doesn't he, this yeah. rhino? Seven foot tall with claw-like things and a thumb is very reptilian. You've described a reptilian, but that that hairy hide on the torso, is that proper hide or is that like some sort of covering? Unsure. Okay. Are we going to have an artist rendition of it later on? No. Can you draw me one and send it to me quite late at night? Yes. Thank you. For science. Okay, so... 
Are we going to cover the physical examination further or should I question it? I mean, you can question it. We're not really going to go into detail. About Are it. things going in the butt? I do not know. He doesn't say. All we know is that he has a physical examination. Uh, he okay. is held against the wall. Uh, leg spread. But then we d- yeah, we don't know if his feet are on the ground or off the ground. This is very unpleasant regardless. Mm-hmm. We don't know if they are it's injecting him. giving me... Samples. Well, actually it's not, but it is. Slight Huggins vibes from our very first episode in that they're taking him to a room for physical examination. Are they going to lube him up? Oh, no. Villas Boas had the lube shoved over him, didn't he? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Huggins was just a sex machine. Was it Huggins or Villas Boas who had the funny gas pumped into the air that might have been like a disinfectant? Oh, it's been so long. That might not have even been either of those two. Maybe it was both. But it feels, it's kind of reminiscent of other cases we've covered, I guess is the key point. Yet with one unusual detail, rather than being greys or greens with Jiminy Cricket perverts jacking it in the corner... It's a reptilian with a hairy chest. (laughs) It's a rhino pervert by the looks of it. Maybe the dominant ones get hairy chests, like orangutans get the flanges. Dominant reptilians. Do you reckon there's ever been a crocodile with a hairy chest? I bet if there has, that was like the most legendary crocodile. It was like the macho man of crocodiles. Big Jimmy. Or the... um, Everyone knew him. The Rick Rude of crocodiles. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) The room in which Brian received his examination had a pole in the middle of it. Oh, yeah. The pole ran from the floor to the ceiling and had a strange box in the middle of it, which is something that we have heard of before. Pole. Oh, the strange box. Yep. Pole in the middle of a room of a box. Which case was that? I cannot remember. It was one of mine. That's a lovely picture of SpongeBob pole dancing you've included there. Just. When you said this episode is going to be a long one. Are you sure what you're not... Wait, that's not a sentence. <laughs> what you're suggesting is that it's just loads of silly pictures to make me laugh, isn't it? Spongebob shouldn't be pole darks, and I'm sorry. That just feels wrong to me. Spongebob isn't a sexual creature to me. <laughs> I don't know what you said to me. <laughs> well, your eyes kind of beamed up, so... I don't want to... Each to their own. This strange box was directing an intense beam of light at Brian, and one of the beings was stood by the box, manipulating it in some fashion. He was able to see at times and notice that the strange fog was seeping into the skin of the being. The box was then moved down the pole and the light at Brian's feet. He recalls warm and cold fluids running over his legs. Hmm. Is this like Pandora's box? Or is it like... Is it the Ark of the Covenant in Indiana Jones they open up? Yeah. I think it's just a box in the middle of the room that they use. It has different functions. I don't think exactly. the... Um, well, if the wrong person opens it, it kills them. If the right person opens it, better functions. Is Brian like Indiana Brian? Indiana Brian. <laughs> no. Do you remember that episode where I referred to myself as Indiana Greybeard for a whole episode? That's good, wasn't it? I don't. <laughs> you don't? No. When I went on the... I was working in the museum and I went on the adventure. Vaguely. It's been so many episodes. Again, I may just have to go back and listen to something. The great re-listen 2023. The light was then shone at his face. Just to add, you'll remember it when I say this. The title was Indiana Greybeard and the Crystal Skull. Yeah, I remember. (laughs) (laughs) There's another indie film coming out. (laughs) (laughs) I've just sidetracked you massively. I hope they do indie better. Are they? (sighs) Have you rewatched The Crystal Skull? I've never watched it. How can you hate it so much then? I don't plan on watching it. What? Like, 
I mean, I'm not saying it's the best film or anything, but how can you hate it so much when you've never seen it? I can't bring myself to. You've got a real passion against it. Where did that come from? Because... South Park, wasn't it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Based your opinion on the movie solely on South Park saying it sucks and that George that. Lucas it and Steven the, Spielberg yeah. buggered indie. Yeah. And the reviews that were cut, I generally don't um, let reviews guide my judgment of a film mm -hmm. because but you let South Park. Everyone's taste is <laughs> different. more trusty source. But <laughs> both South Park and the reviews just put me in a, I can't bring myself to. Because <laughs> it's like a, I know everyone shits on Star Wars. You have those that absolutely love the classics, and you have yeah. those that love and like the new ones. I really don't mind either because I'm not a diehard of the originals. Yeah, I I enjoyed the new ones actually. I've got to be honest. I am very aware that those films are made for children, whereas indie, that's different. Fast and the Furious. I know that every Fast and the Furious film that now comes out is going to be dog shit compared to the first one. <laughs> yeah, I still can't stop watching them. The Rock. He's never in a great film, to but he's fair, never not, in an awful film. I've not watched film. the latest one. I kind of want to go back and watch all the indies now. The Great Rewatch of 2023. <laughs> There's definitely a film I want to rewatch, and you'll know why later. Okay. The light was then shone at his face and he felt a headache surge through his skull. It's a crystal skull. The light went out and the being left the room. Rodope skull, by the way, not crystal skull. India and the Greybeard and the Rodope skull. And then almost instantaneously, another being entered. This one was taller than the other. Ooh. Estimated at around nine foot tall. How hairy was the chest? <laughs> you know, I'm just curious. A full on shag rug. <laughs> shag rug. <laughs> It will be! <laughs> this being walked over to Brian and placed its hand on his head and thousands of thoughts instantly filled his head. Like, should I stroke the rug? Should I nuzzle the rug? There is a picture in the research notes and Greybeard is staring at it because he knows where it's from. But at the same time, he can't figure out where it's from. Yeah, I've seen it and I can't think what it is. And I'm now not going to mention where it's from. Fine. Prick. <laughs> but I may reference that picture multiple times just to annoy him. No, I'm not that mean. Have you got it yet? No. It's got Piers Brosnan in it. Sci-fi. The Lawmower Man? There you there. go. Ah, oh, I feel much better. <laughs> Brian, I still wasn't sure when I said that. I was like, I think it's The Little Merman. That's a classic film. I don't think Brosnan's done much sci-fi, though, has he? That's a really classic no. film. Like I forget about that one, but whenever I watch it or see it on TV, I'm like, damn, that's a good film. The graphics look terrible by today's Today, standards, well. but the story in itself is still good. And you can't teach that. So Brian asked who they were and what they wanted with him and Nick. He got an answer, but he couldn't understand the response. Clearly, Brian looked perplexed, so the being spoke again, this time slower and in perfect English. It explained that Brian would be in no pain as the pain was being drained from his body. Via the butt. But Brian still wanted to know who the beings were. What? What? In the it replied, I will tell you and I will show you my peace. It was then that the walls of the craft melted away to Ooh. reveal holographic projections of domed cities what? from a world far away. That makes no sense. It was explained to Brian that this was a vision of the being's homeworld. The planet was devastated by an airborne virus that wiped out the population and those that survived had undergone a mutation. Like super COVID. It also explained that the image of them that Brian sees is not their true form and that they project a cloak of sorrow to those oh. that see them. Oh. 
in memory of <gasps> their fallen brethren. What does it all mean, Basil? It also explains that the cloak acts as a biological shield to shield them from further viruses. Oh no. After this, the holographic images stopped and Brian was no longer being restrained. He asked the being again who he was. The being turned, lifted off the cloak and replied, I am Voltar. I am Voltar! I'm doing a V symbol as I say that. Much like the Z in Dude, Where's My Car? Zoltan! Zoltan. I am Voltar! The being's true form was around seven foot tall. So exactly as they are then. Human-like. With really hairy chests. With striking blue eyes and fiery, long, red hair. So they're Nordics, yet they wear a cloak of sorrow. Ginger Nordics. Yeah, we've, we've heard that, I believe. Blonde and ginger Nordics. Have we? I think so. I, d- I feel I d- like we have. I don't think we have. But regardless, they think that the Nordic form is too much for us, so they appear like reptilians with hairy chests. What the actual frick? So would you say their human-like forms are the mutation? Or do you reckon the red hair is a mutation? <laughs> <laughs> not, well, we have that. That's not much of a mutation. Yeah, but a mutation a for person. them. I mean, for a Nordic, that could be a mutation. And it's too much for the human mind to comprehend. No, it's so too they, much for them to comprehend. So they, re- they wear their mask they, of yeah, sorrow. They don't want gingivitis. Uh, oh, man. Um, Reference our fuck. Yeah, I've just twigged one... Well, not twigged, sorry, um recollecting one more thought I had as you were going over there. Um, thousands of thoughts in the mind all at once. What would that be like? And there's a reason I ask. My... Braingasm. The best dream I've ever had, and I can't remember if I've told this on the podcast before or not, but the, the video the, to Supergrass yeah. pumping on the stereo, where the video is a bunch of caricature puppet-like figures of the band Supergrass with massive long legs and long arms and all bendy all over the place. I had a dream where I was all of them at once, only it was me, not them. So I was four people at once in this dream and it was euphoric. It was the best thing ever. Can you imagine being four people at once experiencing everything all at once? I reckon this person with a thousand thoughts all at once just (laughs) spaffed his pants. It's too much. My dreams are generally pretty vivid, and I tend to remember them, but I've never had something like that. That yet? Yeah, well, I would never have since. I've controlled Maybe I was visited by these folks that night. I have controlled one and... Controlled a dream? Yeah. Are you sure you weren't just awake? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, this, this, this is going to sound really... Yes, it is. ...fucking bad. In my dream, I... You weren't killing people again, were you? No, but yes. <laughs> so yes, then. <laughs> so in my dream, there was a fire in a building and I was going in and saving people from the building. And mm-hmm. I turned around to walk back in to save someone. And it was someone I really didn't like. So I was telling myself in the dream, do not go in there. Just leave them and turn around. And in the dream, I just left them and turned around. (laughs) And then I woke up and I was like, you're a fucking terrible human. But you made the right call. And then I was like, I'm never going to do that in real life. And then the next week. (laughs) Um, So, yeah, I've done that. And I have also murdered my father and brother in my dream and woke up thinking it was real and that the police were after me. One of I our would good also friends like to say that I have no father and brother. <laughs> Wink. <laughs> <laughs> uh, one of our good friends is a therapist. You know, just to, know. just to put it out I, there. I know. <laughs> Might go and see them. Well, they're, they're coming am, to see yeah, us soon. <laughs> I am going to see them soon. I'm going on a man date without me. He doesn't care about me. You don't lift. <laughs> I could lift. Lift you. (laughs) 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 
Don't flex at me as I'm doing it. <laughs> so you hear that song, you can't help yourself. As you didn't mean to. Exactly. Ah. <laughs> How'd that microphone taste? Uh, considering this is a long episode, we've absolutely derailed this one on a tangent. Oh, well. It's probably not as long as I thought it was going to be. So once Voltar left, a few other beings came in and escorted Brian back to where he first entered the craft. Nick was there waiting, and so were Brian's clothes. He quickly dressed himself, and then they were floated back to the ground. A.K.A. carried. When they touched the ground, they were suddenly dazed and confused. But as he stumbled around getting his bearings, what had happened was crystal clear in his mind. He and Nick got back into the vehicle and turned on the radio, which stated it was 11pm. They'd been gone for two hours. Two hours? They drove home, which took over an hour. An hour? The closer Brian got to home, the more his memories of this encounter began to vanish. Memories. It would be two years and eight days before he found himself back at the spot of the abduction. Like the shadows of my mind. So the song goes. Two years and eight days he returned. Is that because he's remembering and he's going to retrace the steps and whatnot? Or is that because he's been taken back there again? Oh no, he's been called back because they're going for a follow-up examination. What if he is ill? And the reason they've given him the physical examination is to save him. And they're now doing a follow-up call to make sure he continues to live. Because they're just really nice beings. What if? What if? What if? (laughs) Brian knew something had happened. So he went to Dr. McCall and underwent hypnotic regression therapy. It's been a while, believe it or not. (laughs) During these sessions, Brian would start to talk in a strange and mechanical voice. This voice was examined and was found to produce an exact 1,000 cycles per second on an oscillograph. Something which should not be able to be produced by human vocal cords. Later down the line, investigator Tom Green... No. Sorry. (laughs) Sorry. Tim Green... You son of a bitch. ...Beckley got involved. He started probing questions about poltergeist activity and paranormal activity in his house. Brian would go on to mention white streaks of light and white balls of light making their way through his house at their own will. And pure flashes in front of his face. But not orange. But the weirdest one is the brown shaped thing that has from time to time shown up It dashes around the room in crazy directions, and every time that it does, it creates some damage to the home. It's Mr. Hanky. All the electricity and all the circuits in the house have melted, frozen, and burned up. This wouldn't only affect Brian. One occasion ended with his wife in hospital in a confused state. When she returned home well, it wasn't long before she was in a confused state again. When she settled, she would go on to explain events similar to one of Brian's abductions, which he had never spoken to her about in great detail. They're being targeted. One other occasion, this happened again, but she couldn't be calmed down this time and would collapse and start hyperventilating. Paramedics were called and it took four of them to restrain her and get her into the ambulance. Brian returned to check on their son, but found he was not in his cot. Oh, shit. As he frantically searched, he heard the dog barking and rushed to find that the baby was sitting in the back garden at the corner of the patio. Just chilling out with a bevy? This isn't the strangest thing to happen. Brian goes on to speak about the host who was a regular visitor and would speak in a computerised language. What's a computerised language? 10011001. Is that computerised or is that just an English? Just binary. English English saying (laughs) two numbers over and over. (laughs) 
It's exactly what it is, damn it. <laughs> I ain't got a fucking clue what a computerized language is. <laughs> Brian says that the host is more <laughs> of a voice that comes out of him. An inner voice which is not his. Rather than a corporeal form or figure. This host claims that Brian is one with it. While studying Brian one evening, he started speaking a foreign language, unlike the computerized voice of the host. It turns out this language was Greek, and Brian was right-handed. Witnessed by his wife, Brian would start writing with his left hand because he's a fucking legend. <laughs> and he would also write backwards in Greek. Oh, shit. <laughs> this ain't aliens. <laughs> that sounds like demons to me, son. You ain't fooling me. Brian's wife was also spoken to by a strange voice. And it wasn't Brian speaking to her. As this voice spoke directly to both of them. When they asked who was speaking to them, the answer they got was Ashtar. No! Ashtar! They need to get themselves to the Integratron! Oh shit, son! Ashtar. Shit just got real! Ashtar would speak to Marla about moments from her past as if to prove itself. Ashtar would then go on to do something very sinister. He would offer her riches beyond her wildest dreams in exchange for her soul. Nope, not aliens. Back on demons. That's a pathways demon, my friends. Tim Green Beckley would go on to point out that Ashtar and Ishtar are remarkably similar. And Ishtar was a goddess of ancient Babylon. There is a picture of Ishtar. Okay, we've got a picture of Ishtar carved on a wall by the looks of it. Poor, oh, looks fairly human with a very long dress. She's standing on what looks like either a hellhound or a tiny lion. Lion? Lion? <laughs> lion. lion. <laughs> <Even Zion. laughs> I said that about three times. Lion, 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 lion with a fish type head. Head with they hands? also have wings and six candlesticks in their back. Why are you carrying around that many candlesticks? Like, what are you planning to do? Light a hall? What are their spears? Ishmael. Is Judge that the name, sorry? Ishtar. Ish Ishtar. Ishmael is also holding a lead in one hand that leads me to believe that is indeed a hellhound. I can't really tell what's in the other hand that looks like one of those whip. hot... That's a whip. It looks like a hot poker, you know, what you put on a horse in an old workhouse to make them go like round. brand. Yeah, that's the one, the brand, yeah. Okay, I, I kind of lost my shit a little bit when you said it's Ashtar, but Ashtar's after souls? That ain't the Ashtar we covered before. This is someone... No, it ain't. This is a demon, a pathways demon, targeting someone who has some strange thoughts and thinks that it's aliens to get their soul. Those aliens aren't doing paranormal shit around the house. That's, that's demons. This is demonic possession. Right and backwards Greek? No, 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 no. That ain't aliens. This is pathway demons, my friends. What do they do once they got your soul? Who knows? Maybe they use it as currency. Mm. Or it powers them up, makes them stronger. Could be. Till they can break out of the depths of Hades. Or they're able to take on your form. Shang Tsung style. And do some weird shit. Your soul. It's mine. So Tim would go on to state that it was possible that the ghostly visitors and the extraterrestrial visitors were separate entities. So ghostly. But both attracted to the location due to the Scots' extreme <laughs> vibrations due to their ongoing cosmic experiences. Tim would meet with other investigators who were already familiar with the case. And many of Brian's recordings were recorded, and during one, someone would claim to be Belzebub. Demons! Demons! 
The tapes were checked for tampering and hoaxes, but they all came back genuine. The voices were all drastically different from one another too. Oh, so, so it would appear that different people were speaking at different times rather than someone putting on different voices. I'm about to call an exorcist right now. Beckley would go on to say that although in the face of all this evidence that there was little substance to the messages and that they seemed pretty juvenile both in content and delivery. But he goes on to say that he doesn't think Brian is putting the voices on as some of them were too deep for a human to willingly speak at that tone. Oh, I wouldn't willingly speak at a deep voice. Yeah. Yeah. Gee. Mm-hmm. Um, how do you do I go? I sound like Bane. Hello, Gravel. Hi, Bane. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, mate. You want that bang? You want to go get the beer? <laughs> you were merely born in the pub. I was raised in it. Wait. <laughs> you were born in a pub. Mr. Moonwalker's origin story <laughs> coming to light, folks. Yes, I help you. Lost track of four. Everything you've said in the last section makes me think demons. This is... Typical, uh, what was that? The case, I forget if it was the case the exorcist was based on, or if it was the one with the person who had mental health difficulties and possibly epilepsy. I can't remember if they're the same one or not, but if you hear the recordings of it, it's absolutely terrifying. Reminds the person, me of the film Session 9. Yeah, or um, the Annalise Release Rose, or whatever yeah. it's called. But awful. Is it Emily Rose? So that's no. the, something like that. But the exorcism, the real, of... not the film, the real story. Like if you see the real recordings, absolutely terrifying. This person is obviously very, very unwell. But the voice that comes out of them does not seem possible. This is reminding me of that. This person is possessed by demons, speaking in all these voices. That ain't no alien mo. This is demonic. We've already heard that they're asking for their soul. Now they're speaking in tongues and different voices, writing in backwards Greek. What is an alien going to write in backwards Greek for? <laughs> Come on. So later in life, Brian would go to Bolivia. And it is here that Voltar would return. I don't give a shit if it's juvenile. He's backwards Greek. Tiawanaka, I think. <laughs> Giving Brian more messages. When Brian returned... He was a completely different person, as if his whole personality had changed. He no longer chain smoked and would speak on subjects he wouldn't broach before with such comfort and confidence. Brian was to have a book written about him by a researcher who would become a friend of his, Jim Frazier. Jimmy! Jim would go on to ask for a sign that he was genuine before he'd write the book. To which the host came forth and answered. Of the host, open run one. From the sky now comes a ball of fire for all mankind to see. Of this, one thousand particles of this, I am, I am. <laughs> I am, I Look am. to the west. I'm Henry the Eighth, I am, I am. Given in trust, Lat 3801 North Long 11950 West. Of this, seek of I. Of this, he asked of I. A sign given. If this is where, like, a spacecraft is going to pop up or something, I'm going to lose my shit. But it's not going to be a spacecraft. It's going to be like a falling angel, isn't it? Or a demon fire popping up out of the ground. About... Oh, uh, one more thing, sorry, just because I'm going to lose my trail of thought if I don't say this now. I'm so glad that this person hasn't claimed to be an indigo child. Don't look at me like that. Don't look at me like that. 20 hours later, a ball of fire was witnessed by many. No! And it... No! <laughs> and Demon! Fallen angel! Eject particles from Canada 
to Mexico. Baby demons. These particles would go on to land within 10 miles of the coordinates the host gave. Whoa, 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 whoa. 10 miles, that's not very accurate. Over the years, others have witnessed strange events that have surrounded Brian, such as intricate drawings of advanced technology that he wasn't aware of, detailed information about human history, and auto writing. The writing would be in ancient languages or foreign languages that he had no idea about. Mm. The host would go on to claim that it would reappear on the spider at the Nazca Lines on December 24th, 2011, and would have instructions for Brian and others it had contacted. However, Unfortunately, Brian had passed away, so we have no idea if any of the other contactees turned up for this event and what it was for. Surely one of them would have come out with it. And here is a picture of Brian Scott, although this picture looks really familiar to me. And I don't know if I've seen it before or... It does look familiar. If... Because of the research, I've seen this picture multiple times while researching. Yeah. But it looks familiar. I couldn't place it, but I agree. That looks like something I've seen before somehow. Maybe we've been taken away by these demons in our dreams. Maybe. And there is also a short video for you. Okay, let's get this video going. There's one... Out of bed. Bit that you'll see. I guess the wife expects this by now. She goes out to the garage, assuming I'm out there with the drafting table, but instead I'm standing out in the middle of the backyard, and there's an orange uh, red ball of light, just like when I was a young boy, hovering right over the top of my head. It mentions a name. It was out there in midair. In writing. Nothing holding it there. It was just there. Kind of like semi translucent it would glow. And it glowed. So it took a dive from me and went straight to her. The fear behind seeing the ball of light was not knowing what it was, who it came from, or what it was going to do to you. In the house, outside. He just saw the, the name. I'm pausing this for just a second. <laughs> Did I just see the name Stanley Tiger Romanek? Yes. Is involved in this. You did. The, I think the tiger prick, the person that is doing this video, is also responsible for covering some of those other investigations that we've done. Okay, it's someone responsible for covering it. It's yeah, not someone who's not like faking it or believing it themselves. Because I was going to say the person who's done documentaries on Romanek and whatnot is actually a good documentary maker. <laughs> They're just making a documentary about something. Let's not say they share the views or believe in it mm. okay let's continue this but that tickled me that's why i put it in oh it angered me in the garage in the bedroom i mean you couldn't get to the bathroom this thing just wouldn't appear out of nowhere shoot through the wall reappear i remember taking my daughters and we hid under the kitchen table i know very so menacing people music. like the wife the mm. kids, relatives friends the neighbor the postman they're scared they're afraid of me <laughs> Postman. Postman. Mr. Postman. When this thing would show up, your TV would go crazy. You've got static and snow. The investigators came in the door. It would pulse, make electronic sounds, strange beeping and tweaking. He went out there and he just started swinging mad happy at this ball of light. I'm becoming ill, I'm becoming sick. He was talking, not with his normal voice, and it was very frightening. He was like, frick it, frick it. call my family. And they got cameras and magnetometers. The police reports, the press, all the media. All family, all the headlines. Child Protection Agency, we're going to take my kids away. What? Little psychiatrists that talked with my wife's parents, they talked with his parents, they talked with other family members, and they sort of came up with the best plan in all this would be that I should just get away from this myself. Asked him if he wanted to see me, and he said yes, and that's how it started. I fell in love with Brian Scott. I met Jim Frazier, but he no. was a lot different than anybody else. This is Romanic Mark II, isn't it? You son of a gun. A ball of fire would come, 
got a hold of Jim and I said, well, uh, how's the not see it coming? Sign, something's supposed to happen. This is what it's supposed to be. Some kind of a ball of fire or something's going to appear. 24 hours later, this meteor just suddenly comes in across uh, the coast of California. I had managed to write down the exact latitude, the longitude of I bet where you this had. meteor was going to final end. Um, the sky lighting up, the trees lighting up. Hank and Twistleman, <laughs> Deputy <laughs> Sheriff. Has a phenomenal moustache. So once Jim actually heard, had heard that this event really did occur, he decided to jump in with both feet. And water drops just appeared out of nowhere on his skin. My left hand is going like crazy, writing, jacking writing, it. Jacking all it, jacking it. Sweat. symbols and <laughs> diagrams. And my right hand is kind of sitting here like a little noodle. Basically, it's all backwards. That weren't what the little noodle was, my friend. (laughs) So, all these different types of paranormal experiences now make sense to me. It's not because this person is being visited by aliens, demons, or every type of paranormal entity. It's because this is the second coming of Romanek. Some captain bullshitter who's just claiming everything to draw numerous partners into his traps i like how you save that till the end uh are you happy with the demons so this is part of the probe where we turn to science and skepticism skepticism surely not i couldn't find much science and skepticism here which we wouldn't ourselves bring to the table and i couldn't find any from anyone else so we'll get to ours at the conclusion okay so i would think that one part of skepticism to lay on the table here would be that this is all this bloke's brian's claims nobody has verified this the backwards greek writing could have been written upside down and the paper turned around when no one was looking then he went downstairs and showed the paper to people he was like i just wrote this what does it all mean, Basil? Basil. <laughs> yeah, all these coordinates. Brian could have been searching for upcoming meteor events and whatnot to pull the wool over people's eyes, because that seems to be the type of person that Brian may be. Skepticism. 101. So to summarise... You muggy prick. <clears throat> we have the story of Brian Scott, who whilst out walking his dog was approached by a bright orange ball of light which then shot off. Twelve years later, he took a drive to Superstition Mountain with his friend Nick. Whilst there, they pulled over and got out to scan their environment. Brian saw a craft heading their way and before he could move, it was over him and had him in a beam of light pulling him up from the ground and into the craft. Once inside, Nick was also there. They were taken to a room which was then entered by some strange looking creatures. The creatures stripped them, then took them to separate rooms. Brian was put up against the wall and restrained by some invisible force and physically examined. After the examination, he asked who the creature was and why he was taken. He got an answer that he couldn't understand, so asked again and was told in plain English. He was then shown the creature's home planet via holographic images and the backstory no jutsu of the creature was also explained to him. After this, he asked the creature its name and it replied, I am Volta. While showing him his true form, it left the room and Brian was escorted back to where he initially came in. Nick was there. Brian got dressed and they were put back on the ground. Years later, Brian would undergo regression therapy and be questioned by investigators. And during these sessions, more would come to light. From a mechanical voice that would speak from Brian's mouth and other beings, including Beelzebub. These were all spirits or beings talking through Brian. This would not only affect Brian, but also his wife, who would suffer states of confusion from time to time and also communicate with a being known as Ashtar. An author who would go on to become a friend of Brian's spoke about how before he would write the book, he would want proof. So the host came forth from Brian and spoke, giving him a prediction. 
the sign came to pass, so the author started his work. Others also speak about the multitude of languages that Brian would randomly start speaking or writing in along with various scientific pictures he drew. The host claimed that he would one day return and gave coordinates and info of other contactees that would meet there. But Brian unfortunately didn't live to see this day. Now, we're not sure whether or not the others met or if the host survived following Brian's death. I'm sure. And this bit's just for you. Time <laughs> is on my side. Yes, yes it is. Time <laughs> is on my side. Yes, it is. Now you always say that you want to be free. But I'll come running back. I'll come running back to you. So that is a snippet from the film Fallen, starring Denzel Washington. Which I really one, want to rewatch. One of my favourite ever films. It's probably never going to win any. Well, it didn't win any awards, to my knowledge. But for me, that one just hits the spot. I mean, I don't want to spoil it for anyone. Just go and watch it if you're into the. Denzel doesn't make a bad film. Ah, oh, what well, I I resisted singing that so many times <laughs> earlier on in reference to that film when we were talking about demons I just kept on thinking Tam, get your mouth out. yes, yes it, is. it is now you always say oh, I'm gutted to be honest <laughs> <laughs> why? because I just really wanted this one to be demons I love that side of the paranormal. I find it so interesting. I can get so on board with it. But when it's shitty little like <laughs> I'm kidding. Well, partially kidding. Yeah, this just felt like the sort of individual we've covered two or three times before that's trying to profit from... And when I say profit, I don't just mean financially. I mean in every aspect of life. He's manipulating those around him to gain what he wants. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Can't can't get on board with this one, sorry. I'm not saying that it was aliens, so I don't know if I'm getting ahead of schedule or not, but screw him. Nah, that's fine. F Brian. I'm in total agreement. The life of Brian was bullshit. <laughs> and I'm not referring to the Monty Python film. I mean, if what would have helped his cause is if we would have heard from Nick. But there's jack shit from Nick. Um every kind of mm. event that you hear from has happened before to someone and the bit where there were water droplets on his arm <sighs> that's sweat <laughs> I'm sorry. he's just a sweaty betty yeah, just a sweaty betty so yeah i mean there's no need for me to ask you you you've clearly already decided and i'm with you so thank you for joining us for this week's probe it has been a trip a real shitty trip as always, <laughs> no disrespect to the episode. <laughs> <laughs> you can find us on Facebook at But It Was Aliens. Our Facebook group is Extraterrestrial Towers. It's a secret. Don't tell anyone, but invite all your friends. We're also on Instagram at But It Was Aliens Podcast and on the Twitter at But It Was Aliens. Got it in this week, you slow bastard. <laughs> we have a Patreon. <laughs> At Patreon <laughs> forward slash but it was aliens, where we take a dive into the l less extraterrestrial and more paranormal. <laughs> and occasionally we mention Rasputin's dick. Seldom, but it does happen from time to time. As always, I have been Moonwalker, he has been Greybeard, this is but it was aliens remember the truth is up there hash tag
Have a massage.